Good afternoon, everyone, uh, or uh, good afternoon to our audience in Guyana and North America. And good evening to those joining us in the UK or elsewhere in Europe. On behalf of Moray House Trust, welcome to this poetry recital featuring the work of Stanley Greaves. For any newcomers, Moray House Trust is a private, non-profit, non-partisan, based in Georgetown and dedicated to promoting Guyanese culture and public discourse. My name is Isabel de Caris. I'm the chair of trustees at Moray House Trust and your host this afternoon. Please note that this event is being live streamed via Facebook. If you are on Zoom, and would prefer not to be visible, please turn off your video, which is usually uh, the little video icon on the bottom left of the Zoom screen. Tonight's event is dedicated to the poems of Stanley Graves. Earlier today, speaking to a poet from another part of the Caribbean, we pondered the relevance of poetry right now. The discussion sent me searching for a sentence of Martin Carter's, unearthed by Dr. Gemma Robinson, who will hopefully be joining us. And this, and I quote, in 1990, in his private notebook, Carter wrote, poetry, a way of surviving. If life is the question, asking what is the way to die, poetry is the question, asking what is the way to live. Many years ago, uh, a friend and contemporary, Bill Carr, described Stanley as a polymathic artist, painter, sculptor, potter, and musician. Stanley does not consider himself a poet. He composes what he calls poems. This recital will draw on work from Horizons published in 2002, The Poems Man in 2009, and The Haiku in 2015. Martin Carter's influence as friend, poet, and personality looms large in this selection and in Stanley's of in general. The recital itself will last about half an hour and Stanley will be available to answer questions afterwards. I usually refer to my poems as poems, because when I consider the work of other people, I, I don't think I'm, I can be classified in the same, in the same, so I call them poems. Um, I know that um, I refer to my writing why I call them poems. It's like an internal conversation that I'm having with myself based on some perception or some insight or some idea. And then I have to write it down and then I have to edit it. So for me, it's, it's, it's kind of like a, a, um, a conversational, a conversation which can be shared with others, of course, when published.
The only other poem I did like that was um, uh, The Last Walk, uh, Martin Carter's um, that I wrote for Martin. That's when I, I, I literally sat down and cobbled together. It was a, it was a difficult job but I felt well even though I do not like writing in this manner I felt I should do it and so so I did I did do that um, that poem. last walk I write to you I write to you and so a plangent tale is born like old Cuffy Atta Accra and the fateful siege of Dagrad as Diana now enshrouded in the curse of ballots of deceit in the very streets you walked, smoke and bullets seek victims awaiting the elusive count, the way young lovers and salient memories haunt the grey adamant wall that created a long, haunted coast. O oh, parlous day. O oh, parlous day. The votive streets you often danced, Stand strangely still and enchanted like Chinese landscapes you loved. In byways, shadows absent themselves as your being, now bereft of words, is drawn by horses of wondrous form, worshipped in your cosmic visions. The litany of priest and family and unfamiliar constraints of church, even hymns, must have seemed strange but not the songs of grace you loved. We're of all the flowers gone, of proclaimed and a private triumph, your family wild and for Ireland. The gods of Parnassus, name place like some ruined Guyana plantation, must have in deliberation drawn the ironic circle of chanting citizens, hurling political names in fury along your last walk to a defined space. Fury, often limbed in adamant lines, living in your trenchant poems, refuting seasons of pernicious politics. Sentinels of trees, salute of proud guns greet you, the poem's man, born in a flag-draped boat of purple wood, riding a tide of true lucid poems on that journey eternally defined by welcoming Osiris in green and black and Isis attending in robes of white, celebrating the truth of life and death, a demanding mantle you proudly wore. I write to you, I write to you finally. And so a plangent tale is born. First connection with, with poetry, of course, came from our, our book school, Books West Indian Reader. And of course, we have to deal with, with, um, with English, British writers. Um, it was not until Kayak Overall that I got hold of, started to read Kayak Overall when I left um, St. Stanislaus, that I came into contact with the, with the local uh, poets. Um, I did a level examinations, and of course, I had to contend with, with English writers, and I, I I could not deal with the people like the Miltons and the Pope and all the rest of them. So I, I settled for Wordsworth and also for Browning, Robert Browning. Wordsworth I could deal with because he his descriptions were of landscapes. So I, I can't handle that landscapes. Uh, Browning intrigued me because his his verse is very um almost like like conversation-wise. And I liked the, the, the um, his, his language was not affected. There were no sort of a poetical effect. So I liked that. So I thought I would, I would, I would try my hand in this poetry thing. So I did, <laughs> I did some early poems, which were horrible. Fortunately, the, um, that first notebook got lost. I have six notebooks of poems. 
Uh, the first one got lost, so I had to start over all again, which is just as well. So the first notebook is in 1962 and goes through to 2008. Um, that's, that was when the, the, um, the, the poetry muse decided she has had enough of me and she disappeared permanently. Um, I published two books, Horizon, and the second book um, was called uh, The Poem is Man, which related to Martin Carter. And the third book of poems is a haiku. Uh, the haiku. I have um, spent a lot of time dealing with, with, with Caribbean poets because I, I am more attracted to the metaph metaphysical side of poetry rather than the lyrical and descriptive side of poetry. I'm not denying the, the, the worth and the value of such poetry. It is just that I, I am not connected to that style of writing. And so I found that um, when I discovered the French symbolist uh, Rambo and Baudelaire, I said, yes, these are the kind of people I'm interested in. And so is Martin as well. And then, of course, uh, later on, I, I, I got hold of the South American uh, uh, poets, uh, Neruda, uh, Vallejo, and Borges. And it all fitted in with, with, with my way of thinking. And so I, I continued, and I continue to read those. Uh, the one who is out of that um, French and South American thing is um, Emily Dickinson. Yes, I, I, I latched on to Emily Dickinson very well. When I read her, I said, look at this. The first thing that struck me was the concision of a writing. You know, no extraneous matter. And I, I tend to do that with my own work. Um, in an original poem, when I'm finished cutting it down to size, it is us ends up usually about a half or one third of the original length because I'm very severe in, in, if an image does not fit in, I throw it out. And I am very careful about the use of adverbs and adjectives because those two things get you into trouble, <laughs> adverbs and adjectives. So I tend to use them very, very carefully. It was actually Stuart Brown, who saw, I think, two or three of my poems in Kaik overall. And he asked me about publishing. And I said, I'm not really interested in, I'm not a poet. I'm not interested in publishing poems. So he said, let me see some of your work. <clears throat> <clears throat> so I sent, I sent a whole set of poems to him. And I said, you know, you do what you like with it. You know, so he took it to, uh, to Jeremy Pointing. And lo and behold, I was most surprised when they did not remove any of the poems. So I said, oh, something is going on here, all right. And so I have to thank um, Stuart Brown for, for, for leading, me, leading me out of uh, where I was hiding, you know, writing my stuff, very personal stuff, I felt. Um, leading me and, uh, you know, to publish, uh, publish work. So I'm very grateful and appreciate to him and appreciate very much of this interest in, um, in my work. Yes, so that's, that's it. Um, usually, I, I um, unlike like people like John A. Gard, I find it very difficult, very difficult to to sit and say, okay, I'm going to write a poem about something. Very, very difficult. I have to wait until the something, the something arrives, and then I'll be able to, I'll be able to write. Um, I got into, I got into um, trouble when. My daughter, Sonia, the birth of her daughter, Isabella. And she said to me, can you please write a poem for the, for the baby, Isabella? And I, I said, oh my God, I said, this is big, big trouble. 
um, what am I going to do? Because we just sit now and think of Isabel and just write. For me, I call that word smithing. You're fitting words and phrases together to arrive at something. And I, 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 I can't, I, I find that difficult to do. I feel it's, it's kind of a sham. It's not genuine. Anyway, um, two lines arrived and I was able to write the poem. So a poem entitled Isabella. Spend a little time with me and I will sing you a song of quiet, simple joys. Strange the world to new still eyes and meaningless sounds to ears. But stranger still is the music of rain on small birds bathing, toads mimicking rocks and roads without end. Small hands will delight in the smoothness of pebbles and tongue to eager spoon. But of all such things, most enduring will be voices near and far that will always say, we love the wonder of you. A poem entitled Time Number Two. There was a time when there was no time, and the legends began of impossible beasts and incredible heroes whose graves we cannot find. As we look through clear air or empty rooms, one timeless quest question appears. Is there a place, some imperturbable windless place? where thoughts eventually go, or the sensation of time, part of the time of time, some miracle of construction, like bone, sinew, feather, or mysterious relation between long and spoken word, what would it be if I read a new time. What would it be if I read a new time? Childhood by Stanley Graves. I walked along the avenue of my childhood. And as always, the wind blew my steps away. In the shadow of gentle trees, I watch soft raindrops change into small birds of delight. How loud is the clamor of unbidden memories upon the virginity of friendships long gone like haze upon the unrelenting severity of a dispassionate horizon. Images of time past are stored in the back of a lonely mirror, like leaves of a forbidden book. And it is not sadness, only the strange, weary joy of accessible, Inevitability, newfound companion on that same avenue of yet another childhood. The next poem is entitled Morning Song and it is dedicated to my mother who used to bring me loaves of bread on Saturday mornings or Monday mornings, homemade bread. The opening lines, parting words from my mother one Monday morning 
caused this poem to be written. And the opening line is, the morning is dry. That's what she said. Morning song. The morning is dry. Beetles have lost the race against the rise of the sun. On a bed of rumpled dreams, I encounter complexities, things that come by night and what the eye sees by day. Knocks on my door, conversations that go nowhere, footfalls and two notes of the singing frog. Propound the question of what to do with silence. Propound the question of what to do with silence. The morning is dry and beetles have lost the race against the rise of the sun. Wish for a poem by Stan Green. Is it your wish? As strange wishes go, that continually I renew my presence like the cat with bird gifts. Renewal and change are not the same leaves, though of the same tree. That wish for surprise, becoming eternal delight, makes us the child, playing with forbidden matches. Will it flower to flame? Change should change our perception of pleasure. Yet, we long to swim twice in what seems the same river though the ancient one said we cannot step twice however in that place do not then look for surprises in wrapped occasional boxes look instead for other gifts in my not the same a poem entitled The Room. The floor was painted with pepper sauce, walls covered with soup, doors were biscuits, all cracked and flaked, and windows were sliced pumpkin loop. The room was illumined by bunches of mangoes and bright banana fingers. All the guests sat quiet at tables of smoked meat with knobbed bones for legs. The chairs were clean roots of cassava and yams and everything looked so neat. But the worrying thing in everyone's mind was, what were they going to eat? I liked, um, I like to read the Guyanese poets, um, not only out of a sense of nationalism, but because also there is a certain feeling within them that I find even among our artists. And I, I feel it has something to do with the connecting, being connected to the land. 
And I also remember Martin's poem that struck me was the one that he called Listening to the Land. And it, it was within my own way of thinking where my artwork is concerned because I felt you had to see, look at, and listen to the land. And you do not necessarily have to reproduce what you are seeing or looking at, but it is the spirit of the land which has to inform what you're writing. So Mahadai Das, wonderful. Uh, Mark Mokwat, yes. Um, my first book of poems won the Ghana Prize uh, for first publication of poems. The second book, Horizon, uh, the second book, which was The Poems Man, um, it was shortlisted. But I realized there's no way that could win the Ghana Prize because it was mostly uh, um, sort of metaphysical speculations. And it had very little directly to do with Guyana. And I had read, I had read uh, um, Mark McQuart's uh, book before and I said, wow, oh yes, this is definitely, definitely first prize. Because it's not only his, his spiritual and metaphysical insights, but also the way in which he described his connection with the land. And you can tell this is Guyana. So I said, hooray, yeah, that, that, was, um, that was it. Uh, I was told that my work um, was influenced a lot by Martin Carter. And I said, but of course, why not? Why should I be influenced by, by Yeats or Keats or, or, or these people? You know, so I felt happy to know that um, my work related to what has been done, what has been achieved uh, by Martin. And, um, and that's, that's where I stand. Thank you. Imaginary Life by Stanley Greaves. I did not recognize it. Everything lies under your feet, the poems man said. Many leaves have fallen since. It seems now as if I have always lived in constructs of ageless imagination, in dimensions oblivious of cultural boundaries. It is here. Bright fruits are always sweet. Birds do not eat carrion. Crude extravaganzas never appear as rain. It is all I ever wanted in a midnight's minute. Sameness, Stanley Greaves. Late night glass of small spiced rum, companion book and convoluted memories seductive sleep intervened. Steadfast floor restrained the book's descent to infinity. In early raid morning, rum was still in glass. Book and memories played on foot awakened floor. I drank the rum. Was it same rum? Same book? Same memories? Same floor? Pens and Words by Stanley Graves Pens and books sleep beside me. Arising, I shake sheets of a crop of dreams they should have written. My friend the poet once said, you can write a poem on anything, if a poet. The urge to write comes like fireflies, steady light, as I try to write a story of pens and books beside me. With ready pen, open page, I write of something else, instead of their mutual love. How must I contrive then to write of pens and books? Go mad, my friend the poet said. Go mad at least once. 
Action is not the prerogative only of gods we cannot see. We need the realm of knowing or freedom, like a nestling challenging flight on supportive wind. Let madness come singing all the poems we want to remember, that glorious advent of visions becoming friends. Significance. Like a perennial flower, a thought still blooms about the significance of things. How was the first word recognized as word? When was that problem abruptly pushed aside, attempting to describe color flash of a rare wing or crystal fear in a child's eye? These were significances, with poets adding many more. The love many hearts knew and mysteries swarming like bees. Despite basket of words from devoted probing minds, the question still remains. Poem entitled Sky to Sing. Brush by one another like grains of waves tossed sand, each alone to interior song or poem. As keen field smoke kills the sun in a sky that needs to sing, in a sky that needs to sing. In this world comes a child. On blinking, questioning, reminding us of things past, praises to God secure elsewhere, and the songs we lost, and the poems we lost, in a sky that needs to sing, in a sky that needs to sing. Haiku poems are very strange because um, the poetry muse had left around uh, 2006 and I didn't hear from her again. And then one day a line appeared and um, after the line appeared, two, three lines and then nothing more. I said, okay, she's probably come back again. And this happened for about on three occasions. I said, this is most odd because normally after a line arrives, I'm able to write a complete poem. And then I go back and I use my cutlass and I chop it down to size. So something said, look at these three, four, uh, four lines carefully. And when I did, I said, well, wait, these things are probably haiku poems. And so I um, altered the sil syllables, nice 17 syllables. And um, I ended up writing something like about 100 and 108 or something haiku poems. Uh, out of which was the publication. After that, no more, no more poems. Because that's that's a system I use. Two lines, which is a perception, and then a conclusion. So the conclusion is is sort of like to to strike, cause cause a, a, a twist in your mind. Because they're very tight, and at the end of each one, you need at least a few seconds to to work out what the last line, the punchline, what is it getting at based upon the imagery that comes in the first two lines.
faces in the clouds so easy to see in my mirror a mystery Head in air, feet on ground, what exists between my thinking and my walking. Red handprints in caves. Wallpaper for bats. Aesthetics is an old god. I hope you all enjoyed that um, and I'm delighted to see that Stanley is there in the audience. Um, so if there are any questions or comments, um, um, I'm sure he'd be happy to, to hear them. Um, uh, and um, I, I, I'm sure he'd also like to I noticed uh, Dr. Stuart Brown in the audience. Um, and uh, there was someone else that I wanted, whose presence I wanted to acknowledge. Um, but uh, yes, hope you enjoyed that. It's actually the first time Stan Lee's seeing it. So Stan, did, was there anything that um, you wanted to correct or add? to to that you're on mute yeah Can you hear me now mm -hmm. yeah no. no i rather enjoyed um, uh, listening and looking i i can't believe that i've written some of those things uh, it's, it always happens when i go back into the books and i begin to read some of the things that i wrote and um they still, they still retain for me um, things to think about. And um, I, I don't miss uh, not being able to write because I said I'm not, I don't consider myself to be a poet, which means that I have to be writing uh, consistently, continually and consistently. So if a line comes, well, I, I will deal with it. If it doesn't, well, I'll, I'll go off and, and cook a pot of soup or something, you know, do something else. Yes, it's like that, you know, because um, for me, for me the, the, the life of the imagination has always been uh, something very pertinent and uh, pertinent and important to my life. And uh, I go back to my early childhood because um, my best friend was my imagination because I could, I could play with my imagination to all kinds of, and do all kinds of things. And I think that has um, continued. It, it has remained a, a, an unbroken thread, really. Uh, to this date. So the world of the imagination is very important. I think um, West Indian reading books, when I first came across some of the um, the fairy tales, um, you know, I was, I was totally hooked and followed up. That uh, mythology came next and uh, mythology as um, interest in mythology has continued to this day. And um, I remember reading um, the works of Carl Jung and about his life and, and recognized um, what he, what he calls the collective unconscious and that there are images that appear in all cultures and for him that that um, symbolizes a certain uh, um, access accessibility to a spirit or a notion that is accessible there to people all over the world in all cultures and I, I like I like the sound of that very much and so um, I think I was, not I think, I was 11 years old when I came across um, a book written by Mika Altari, the Egyptian, and um, 
it was about the li a life in ancient Egypt, a little boy growing up um, and going to be an apprentice in a temple. He had to learn how to sweep the floors and then he was able to do all sorts of things. Um, how, to, how to make walking sticks, how to, how to grind pigments and paint pictures until he became, he became a high priest. And for me, the adventure of that little boy was a kind of um, adventure. I, I could see myself being a little boy quite easily. Um, I began to read about the um, Egyptian mythology. and It is more than Egyptian mythology, it's also a theology. And I found, I found um, ideas and concepts in there that ring true to this day. Um, one of the, the most important concepts was um, the birth of the universe. Um, interesting was that the god um, uh, Amun is self-created. The god Amun created himself. And then he had a thought. And then one of his assistant gods, Tha, who was like a secretary of bird, um, Tha uh, took um, the thought and created a word. And when that word was uttered, that was the creation of the world. Out of nothing and out of water came the, the waters came first. Then came the, the Ben Ben, the earth kept coming out of the, out of the water, which is the capstone that you see on, the, um, on, on those um, uh, pylons, the obelisk. You see that triangle, that is, that is the, the symbol of the earth arising from the, the primordial waters. So I, I still read them and it's, it's fascinating stuff because the principles, the principles which are represented in symbols and by their gods, those principles hold true to today. And in reading in, in quantum physics, I see the connection. And there is, there is a connection between the things which are being discussed in quantum physics and religion, it's very close. So it's interesting because actually while you were talking there, it just put me in mind of a, an, a lecture that, um... George Simon, the late George Simon, gave at Moray House probably a decade ago, um, in which he picked up on some of these, I, I don't know what you'd call them, confluences, um, where symbols um, seem to reappear across, um, across religions and across cultures. Um, and obviously he was approaching it um, with um, the gaze of an archaeologist as well as the gaze of a of a an artist, um, so I think maybe maybe sometimes in Guyana we are because of the confluence of cultures we are peculiarly well placed to pick up on some of these links. Do you think we, we are indeed? And um, I know there's a time when I this thing about wanting to be connected to the earth has been. being almost like looking for the holy grail but um i started to think that perhaps i should i didn't want to paint landscape just to look at the landscape and paint it that to me was meaningless because i felt that the the the, the understanding of the earth the spirit of the earth would enable you to um sort of transcend the what we call the normal landscape painting so i did i did um Think about two two paintings, close up a close up view of the piece, a little patch of earth and grasses and little pebbles and things like that. That was my idea uh, of landscape. And then I I, I started looking at the, the petroglyphs and the petrographs and, and the various symbols um, which our indigenous peoples you know came across. And I said, oh, this looks like something to examine. So I began to use some of those symbols in paintings. I did three paintings and I said, you are doing total foolishness because you are merely using these symbols in order to construct a painting. So it's, it's meaningless. And um, in any case, what you have to do is to think of your experiences of Guyana and of the earth and whatever and interpret it by symbols of your own creation. That's, that's what I felt. And so I did things, um, I know I did, I actually uh, used that idea, that concept in my ceramics because I used to look at the, 
when uh, drops of rain fall onto water, the concentric rings which are formed and they interlock to one another. So I've used that on some of my pots. And, um, and then I also used to look at the, the, they call them frog's eggs, but they're really toad's eggs. The ones which come like spaghetti, long strings. And inside of them, you see the little, the little, black, um, little black dots, like the eggs. So I've used things like that um, in order to create uh, symbols that I feel will have some meaning and some relationship to, not only to Guyana, but also to my own, my own experiences, visual experiences, yes. Um, so when, when George Simon came on the scene, I felt uh, great because I said, well, yeah, you know, um, it is somebody like George and those who work with him who will have to look into, the, into the, their own mythologies and be able to extract information which they can then use to present in whatever form uh, they wish to. And for me, it was, it was indeed um, a pleasure to see uh, uh, George's paintings and even more so in a sense as well, relatively speaking, because I'm into sculpture, to see um, uh, Ozzy Hussein's uh, first sculptures. Those things, I mean, they hit you in the stomach. You know, they're very, very, very powerful uh, images. And looking, looking at those images, it took me back to um, what I've seen of the masks and some of the figures from uh, West Africa, the Congo, and places like that, because because his work his work had that same that same presence, you know, and that same quality. And I, in the national collection, the ones in the national collections are really mind blowing. They're really tremendous pieces. I do, I do have the the pleasure to own. Um, I don't know. If I can own it, but I do have um, three pieces. Two little pieces by Ozzy and a larger piece by him that I look at and I said, yes, you know, this is this is sculpture, this is what sculpture, sculpture is all about. Yes, I but, actually I have a little one here, which for those, I don't know how well people can see it. Um, yes. But uh, for those who are not familiar with his work, um, oh, yeah. it's uh, yeah, it's um two, two figures. Amazing. It's like two figures together. Yes. Yeah, yes. They remind me of yeah. the work coming out of the, the um, yeah. yes, the, it's uh, in Mali, yes, yeah. and he uses wood, doesn't he? That um, it, Joe will be able to correct us. Is it the salmon tree? No, that, that's, not, that, that's not salmon wood, it is um, no, this isn't, but he uses it sometimes. Yeah, so, sometimes. It's wood that that separates into uh, that, that sort of forks on its yes. own, oh, naturally. Yeah, the Saman, the Saman tree. Thank you. <laughs> uh -huh. there, there, there's, um, there's also a word that he used. Um, I went to see uh, Dennis Williams one day in his office and he had a piece of sculpture on his desk. And I kept looking at this thing. I said, this is a very powerful piece of work. So I asked Dennis, where did you get that from? And he said it was produced by Ozzy. I said, Ozzy? He said, yes. Because at the time, George Simon was, was the, the, um, the principal for the Borough School of Art. And Ozzy used to come and spend time you know, around the place. I never saw him do anything. When I saw he said, yes, that's Ozzy's work. So then I began uh, checking on Ozzy to see what, what he was doing. But while I was looking at the work, I saw, I saw um, the connection between the, the acuity and the awareness of your vision and the way in which that energy can transform whatever material you're using. And I thought um, what I was seeing in Aussie sculpture represented what we were actually trying to, 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 um, to teach. A word just came to my mind that I, I, I always used to hear um, the people who were giving me lessons and in, in, um, for preparing for teacher examination, the word inculcate. <laughs> Whenever I hear that word inculcate, you know, it's always inculcating this and inculcating that. But I thought that is what we were trying to do uh, with the students. So it brought me back to the point that acuity of vision. And because Ozzy was living uh, close to the land and you had to be aware of what is around you and, and be able to relate to it in a significant manner, that allowed him to transform that energy into the pieces of sculpture that he was doing. You know, so, so that is it. And this is why I feel that, that unless we, 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 we try to assimilate um, 
our own being with the very land in which we live. I don't know, we're gonna move around in circles. So for me, it's no point looking across the ocean and say, I'm going to Africa, I'm going to India, I'm going to China, because those cultures were developed in, 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 in those particular locations. So whatever we can learn from how those people develop their culture, how we can learn and put it in the mixing bowl or whatever, but we still have to deal with our direct experiences in Guyana and find an adequate language, visual, verbal, or whatever, um, to deal with those experiences. And that's, that's how I feel about it. So if anyone has a question, do jump in. Um, but Stan, you talk often about um, your poetry, particularly having a metaphysical um, uh, bias or, uh, or focus. And I just wondered what other um, poets, artists, and writers um, in, in, in the Guyanese milieu you would regard as having a similar focus um, and whether there was any cross fertilization. You've talked about Martin's influence, for example, and whether there were any others. Well, of course. Um, I put Wilson at the top of the list because I find um, uh, the way in which he writes, um, you know, your imagination is doing all kinds of things in, in space and time. And um, I like that. And it, of course, his work also is very much founded on the nature of being, of existence, and how you deal with your own particular um, experiences, you know, which is very much so in, that, in this very first book, you know, Palace of the, Palace of the Peacock. Um, and the, in all of the books, um, there is always this thing of dealing with your, um, with your experiences and experiences based on your locations. Because in one of, in one of the titles of his books, um, the artist was actually living in London. And, but the thing that, uh, that attracted me both to himself and to Mittelhauser is that these two writers, of all the writers in the Anglo-Caribbean, these two writers always had an artist, the character of an artist in their books. And by artist, I don't mean a writer, I meant a visual artist. Um, in, in, um, in Wilson's book, uh, what's the name of that one now? where um, there was a, a, an Amerindian artist who was um, part of a Christian mission. And there was a struggle between what the missionary was trying to teach him and what he wanted to do in his painting. And when George Salmon arrived on the scene, I said, Wilson already saw that figure appearing. He already had a vision you know, of that, of that particular figure. So um, those, those are the, the, the two that um, have really influenced, directed and supported my own particular visions or perceptions of what it is to be a Guyanese, you know, and that, and wherever you go, you, you take that baggage with you, unless you deliberately put on a persona and push that baggage in the back. But that persona is, is with you. And I found this to be um, true because I did teach at the Barbados Community College. And I found that the mindset of the students there are uh, very significantly from the mindset of the students at the borough school. Um, the students at the school you had, to, you had to be with them like a jockey on a racehorse. You had to know when to rein them in and because the energy was there. And they were all so eager um, to objectify their image or imagery and their concepts that they, they tended to want to override learning about technical processes. And so, I used to like set up a still life and say, okay, you have to paint from that. I said, no, I'm not really asking you to spend your time thinking that you, you have to paint. The, the still life is simply to have something really still in front of you for you to observe it. And let us then go around and deal with how do you mix your paints? How do you mix your colors? How do you arrive at mixing your colors? And also then how do you apply these colors to your canvas? Whether it's going with your fingers, with a brush or whatever. 
but because the, the, the object or the subject matter is still, it then allows you to use your, your imagination intuition to work with the actual materials. When that becomes second nature, you know, like people who play the piano or type, do typing, I mean, they're looking at something else or looking at and their fingers know exactly where to go on those keys. It's, it's the kind of thing like that. So when that, when that part of your training becomes part of you, you are then very much free to explore and follow, you know, your imagination or whatever concept it is you're dealing with, you know? And um, my, my business in metaphysics, I think stems from my own personal character or whatever you want to call it, as well as the, uh, um, the, the, the 20 years I spend um, in Catholic schools. I went to Main Street School for five years. I returned to teach at Main Street School for five years. I went to St. Stanislaus for five years and I returned it to teach for five years. And it was, it was for me a tremendous experience. I, I did not become a practicing Catholic, but I, I, learned, I learned how to follow what they were saying and uh, extract meaning, extract some meaning that was not doctrinal as such, but extract a meaning that had some substance, some validity uh, to my way of thinking. And I always remembered um, in uh, St. Stanislaus, uh, we had a class that was called RI, um, uh, sorry, RD, religious doctrine. And we were given the full Catholic thing, but we were always encouraged to ask questions. We were always encouraged to question the very, the very uh, uh, doctrines and the dogma that we were told that this is the Catholic dogma and whatever it is, and we were supposed to, we were always, and as boys, we used to get together in groups and trying to find questions. We think that they'll upset these fellows or, you know, run rings up. Of course not, because they're, they're versed in, 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 um, in dialectics and things like that. So they know how to deal with, with those issues. But um, the thing was that it made me begin to think for myself. Because one of, one of my first questions was, they say omnipotence, God is omnipotent. And my question then was, okay, if God is omnipotent, why doesn't he get rid of the devil? He should be able to get rid of the devil, you know? And um, <laughs> years later, I came across um, reading, I, I, I cannot handle reading uh, books written by the French, German, British philosophers. The language is very arcane to me and very difficult. But I did, I did read um, the comments and commentaries about the writings of these people who interpreted what it is, or um, yes, interpreted what they, it was they were attempting to say. And so that led me into, into this question of, uh, which is, I don't, I don't know if there's an answer to it, but it's a question of what is the nature of being? <laughs> what is the nature of being? And, and uh, that is something which it continues to, to amaze and confuse me. What is the nature of being? Because you, there are always experiences you come across if you, if you are very aware of what's going on around you. There are always experiences you come across that challenge, that challenge your existence. And by challenging your existence, I mean not your physical existence only, but also your spiritual and mental existence. And so um, this thing about the nature of being has taken me all over the place. You know, it's like straying about in the bush, you know, wandering around on trails and, um, and having all kinds, of, um, all kinds of experiences, which then you try to interpret and, um, and translate and find meaning out of them. And then also certainly uh, reading the works of Jung and to some extent also Freud, but I was more, more into Jung than Freud. And um, this, this question of dreams. And I remember early on um, reading a dream book, How to Interpret Your Dreams by Freud. And as I started to read through the book, I said, well, hold on. I do not think that the way he is interpreting the imagery in certain dreams that he's dealing with it's the way I would interpret those very same images occurring in my own dreams. In other words, I have to find a way in order to interpret the images in my own dream. And no book um, you know, can, can show me how to do that. 
Mm. That's something I will have to deal with. And that has been, for me, um, a very re rewarding, a rewarding experience. We have a, a hand raised. Um, uh, Leela, would you like to ask a question or make a comment? Hi, Stanley. Thank you very much for the poetry. Um, I was struck by a couple of uh, points in what you were saying, one, one of which is the, the connection with the land. The second is the metaphysical um, element in the work, which also bears a relationship to the, to the land. So my question was to do with whether the creative or the energy of the creative process, say, if you were writing a piece or creating work or writing music in the interior, is different to that in an urban context, say like Georgetown. And, and to extend that further, what happens to that, the energy of that process, where one is outside of the country, say in Barbados or in Europe or in the USA? Um, that takes me back to my camping days. I used to take boys from St. Stanislaus camping in the bush for many years. And the first time we went to Kaicho, planning to go to Kaicho, I'm going to go to Kaicho. So I packed my watercolor set, my what I wanna, I'm gonna go to Kaicho and I'm gonna sit there, I'm gonna do all this, whatever. Um, when I when I went and I saw the 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 force, the majesty or whatever of what I was observing, I realized that nothing that I put down on paper could do justice to what I was experiencing. And so eventually I came to the conclusion that the, the energy that I, I don't know, imbibed, inhaled or absorbed from witnessing uh, that particular fall, the Kaichu fall, I felt that, that that energy can be used in whatever else I'm doing. I, I, can, I can make use of that energy. I can draw that energy and project it onto whatever I was doing. And I do remember for me, the most, um, the most mysterious or significant or whatever the word fall that I came across was a fall called uh, um, uh, Takuga. Um, and this was a fall that I, I looked at this thing and I felt as if I could remain there as like a monk, I could remain uh, living near to that fall for the rest of my life. It had that, it had an impact upon me. And so, that is how I, I um, am going around in the forest and Brianna, or whatever. Whatever it is that was in, of interest to me, whether it's the rocks, uh, a strange butterfly, a strange mushroom, um, the barks of trees, leaves of trees, whatever, whatever uh, energies, to use that word in inverted commas, that I obtained from those could be used in whatever I do. And that has been, that is how I've been working since. So I used to tell my students that, you know, you could be painting uh, uh, um, uh, an orange, a still life of orange and bananas. And the energy that you derived, say, from looking at Kaichiro Falls or riding in a boat through a rapids, you can use that energy and project it into the work that you're doing. And that, that, is, that is how I felt about it. So I think. It's where this whole of, um, of um, transcendence, transcending experiences, uh, transmuting, all kinds of words like that. Um, I think that is where, where it comes in. So I don't know if that satisfies your question. Yes. Thanks. This, we have, um, I feel uh, very strongly about that. It doesn't matter where I live. I look and see things around me and I, I have to deal with them, you know, because where I am now, for some reason, while I've been working, carving and things like that in my workshop, every day from a little while ago, every day a fly, a single fly would appear. And this fly with a light near to where I'm working, chiseling, I'm chiseling. And the fly with a light there and look at whatever it is that I'm doing. And that, that, that went on for quite a while. Another time I'm reading and then, I don't know if it's the same fly or is a friend the fly sent but it, it alighted on the page of the book that I was, re I'm reading the book here and it alighted and it remained there for quite a while before, before, it, um, before it disappeared. So there are all kinds of, of things that come for me, which provide me with, with um, it's interesting. And I wonder what, what's going on here? You know, there's some, is it some message I'm getting? What is it? You know, so it's, it's, um, it's, just, it's just, I think living in a, in a, in a in, and being aware, awareness. I, you know, people are using the phrase "living in the now," and they're all oh, we're living in the now. I, I don't know if 
they really appreciate what it is they're saying because it is it is awareness it is awareness and that awareness is instant you can't measure it it can't be measured it's pointless okay we have uh, and a couple more hands raised um michael mitchell would you like to yeah um first of all thank you so much isabel for putting this together this was just splendid i, I loved it and thank you very much as well um stanley for all these comments um i loved in your poem um we brush by one another like grains of wave tossed sand i feel a bit like that with you i don't know if you remember the last time we spoke was in uh, wilson's uh, wilson harris's yes, uh, living room in chelmsford yes. and i would really have loved to have had so much more conversation with you just as you've had so much conversation with wilson harris um, I hope that everybody who's listening is aware of your extraordinary series of pictures in which you have that conversation with Wilson. And I'm so impressed with the way you wear your sight lightly as a seer. You, um, you have this extraordinary modesty, but at the same time, you are able to um, introduce uh, so many ideas for people who are reading Wilson's novels and mm. seeing your pictures mm. and I um, mean it's just um, it's just marvelous you know you, you really feel I, I was so sorry that you couldn't come to the uh, conference that we set up in in Warwick and um, that would have been really nice I know Ian's the, here this evening he's one of the p participants there um, but anyway um, I was also interested that you um, mention Jung because of course, Wilson Harris was also very interested in Jung and, and talks about having a conversation with Jung. And Jung has always been rather sort of unfashionable in academic circles. Um, so I was very interested to hear what you said. And I don't know if you'd like to sort of say a little more about why you found Jung so, um, so useful. Well, um, when, I, when I read the first set of Wilson's novels, um, it, struck, it struck a very resonant chord because here was Wilson and he was traveling around in the, in the, we say in the bush, but I believe we use that word bush in order to try to contain the energy of the forest because you're lost in there. And if, if you don't have a sense of who you are, finish. So we call it the bush to try to come. Anyway, I, I found certain parallels in his experiences um, uh, which to a lesser extent paralleled some of mine. And I felt, hello, there's something going on here. And um, I remember when I was at University of Newcastle uh, and um, 1964, um, 65, I had to do some painting and I wanted to do uh, paintings based on my readings of Wilson Harris. And I did, I did uh, want to, I did three paintings and they were, they were hopeless. Hopeless, hopeless, and I said, it's not hopeless. But I never gave up on the idea. And it's literally 30 years later. So when you met me at Wilson, it was really uh, 30 years later, and I went to him and I said, Wilson, this is what I'm attempting to do. And he said to me in his, in his um, way, he said, uh, I wish you good luck. <laughs> I, yeah, I told him, I said, Wilson, I'm going to do this because it was a case of win, lose, or draw. Yes, it is win, lose, or draw, but I have to do this. And it was, it was a tremendous, like, it took me 30 years to begin to, to work on those paintings. And I regard it as a conversation, as I call the series, a dialogue with Wilson, because you cannot, you cannot um, visualize what he, what he is doing in those novels. Um, if I wanted to do that, I would have to go into, into movies. It would have to be a movie. It would have to be something, it's not static. You see, the, the painting images are static. So I, I'm, I'm creating images that I felt had some relation to do with, um, with uh, uh, had some to do with what I felt was the relationship between his experiences and mine. And so the first, the first um, set of paintings I did, mm -mm, did not work. 
because I was still entrapped into trying to interpret some of the things or visualize some of the things that were being uh, 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 presented in the novels. But later on, um, as I continued working, the series took me, I think, two years to do, working continuously nonstop. Um, but as I continued working, I think I began to find um, where I needed to position myself <laughs> and in order to proceed with the working. And so of the series, I read, um, I read 24, I read 26 of the novels. And his last novel, well, I felt that any one of Wilson's novels, any one of them, I could have done an entire series of 12 or 14 paintings, any single one of those novels. The last, the last one, I was never able to do anything with it. And I, I still look at it, I, matter of fact, when I say I looked at it, I look at the title of the book and I said, you know, I, I have to deal with you sometime. <laughs> so sometime I have to pick up that book and read about it because that book, um, as he said, when somebody said that his book was like, his writing was like uh, dealing with quantum theory, that last book is very much like that. Yeah. You know, things happening, uh, uh, events happening uh, simultaneously, and yet at the same time uh, being to retain their individuality. I mean, what is that? <laughs> how, how do you do that, you know, in a painting? But, For the um, benefit of the rest of us, what is the title of the last book of the, the Ghost of Memory? Ah, yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. yes. It, it is just an amazing. I think that that one sums up sums up his writing really. It's, it's extraordinary. Up. It's extraordinary, yeah. rather like uh, late Beethoven string quartets. Um, is how string I... quartets, string quartets. You know, yeah. a very fine musician friend of mine, uh, um, Moses Telford brilliant musician and also very well read. We used to have fantastic conversations. And then because he's all in the symphony, Mozart and Beethoven and Bach and so on. So I said to him, Moses, I don't live to the symphonies. And he looked at me, I said, I prefer listening to string quartets. Mm -hmm. He said, why is that? I said, because in a string quartet, you, you, if you, you can follow the, the melodic, the, the sequence of each particular instrument and the way in which they weave into one another and the kind of fabric the kind of song, the fabric that they produce in a symphony. Oh, Lord of mercy, <laughs> heaven help us, you know? So, I mean, I've listened to symphonies and I like Mozart, uh, uh, his last symphonies, uh, some of Beethoven's. And, um, and then I, I, got, I got involved with some of the, the, um, the 20th century composers uh, kind of thing. Um, the, so that was it, but for me, for me, yes. The quartet, that's the thing. That's 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 the listening. That is for me is real listening quartet because you're not you're not totally surrounded by sound and you're able to 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 form a link with the song that is weaving in and out of one another, you know, beautiful sounds. Yes. Yes. Thank indeed. you. Mm. Okay, we have another hand raised. Um been waiting very patiently, Mr. Um Lifcott. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Once again, um, kudos to Maury House for these wonderful presentations. Uh, kudos to you, Stanley. You did not disappoint. You never do. Um, and I think you sell yourself short. Uh, I think Michael quoted one of your lines, and <clears throat> I could quote many lines from your poem, but one that I particularly liked was in a midnight minute. Uh, I just think that's so beautiful, and I'm going to be thinking about that for quite a while, I can do stuff with that. Mm. Um, Stanley, I want to ask a question. Mm. I heard someone saying some time ago that art does, that art critiques and moves um, society forward. Um, in what way, in your opinion, does art do that? And I hope I, I don't put you on the spot. In what way does your art do that, critique and move society forward. Mm. Um, you will find things like that in a, in a number of books on, on art history and criticism about art. But that is a condition that will not take place. And I'm using the word deliberate, it will not take place if the society itself is not understanding and also making a contribution to the life of the artist. And so it's a question of what is the nature, meaning what is the quality of that society? 
What is the quality of that culture? And what is there within the culture that will allow its creative persons, the dancers, the musicians, everybody to access what is in the culture and produce marvelous things? You know, but until, until the particular society or culture um, prepares that ground or has that ground ready, nothing will happen. And I think this is one of, this has been a fundamental problem facing uh, creative arts. Uh, um, I can talk about the visual artists um, in the Caribbean because they end up speaking to themselves. You know, you put paintings into, into an exhibition and people come, oh yeah, it's a nice painting and that's it. Because um, they have not been prepared um, through education and also through an understanding of the nature of the country in which they live and trying to come to grips with that country and what it is or what they think it could be. Um, until that energy is there, the, the, the works of the artists will remain works by the artists and you end up uh, uh, in a soliloquy, you know, you're talking to yourself virtually. And that has been, that has been my, um, my feeling, not now, but for a long time. You know, people come to an exhibition and you don't get, you don't get a particular feedback from them. And you, you are trying to reach out to the nation, reach out to people out there, but the language that you're using is not the language that they understand. And until, until, until our educational systems begin to create within children themselves an appreciation of the land in which they live, which they walk, which they play, and which the land in which they're buried, um, we're not gonna get that. You're not gonna get that thing of what the artists are doing is helping to make the culture move on, move on forward. You know, when you listen, I mean, I have listened to uh, uh, um, a choir from uh, Eastern Europe, uh, Bulgaria. And when I hear those, when I hear that choir singing, the hair literally stands up on my skin because you can tell those people are connected to their land and you can hear it. The same thing happens, you listen to, you listen to, and you see, it's not only listening, but also seeing uh, um, the, the musicians in West Africa, you listen to the rhythms of those drums and you watch the way they dance. You look at the same way that the, the people from Burma and India, where they do the dance, the way, how their hands move, things like that. Those people are aware of the land on, in which they live to, to a very deep ex, uh, um, extent. Um, an awareness which cannot be really uh, put into words as poets and as musicians and as artists, we are trying to make, to give that, uh, um, those experiences some type of form. So if you're, if you're a visual artist, you want to paint. If you're into three-dimensional thing, you want to carve. If you're a singer, you want to create a song. A musician playing an instrument, you want to give that instrument a certain tonality. You know, it's like hearing a, hearing a person playing the sitar from India and hearing a, um, a, a somebody from Scotland playing the bagpipe. Uh, hearing, hearing the drums being played by say the indigenous peoples from, from the West Coast in, in, um, in, in America. You know, those, unless you are, have that connection as far as I'm concerned, some sort of magnetic connection, the kind of thing, the kind of question that, that, you, that you asked, I don't, I don't see that happening unless that connection has been made. And this is what gives the creative works by people from different cultures that authority, the authority that it has. And that authority is something that we need to, to have established within our own, um, within our own region, it's not happening, not happening. But we have, we have the creative peoples who are doing their things, but they are like, they're like a, a comet, you know, they flash across the sky. They flash across the sky. But we, we don't have what we need to have in our constellations. We need to have a constellation which will provide that energy that will give something that will make the culture really evolve. So education has a lot to do with it. A lot to do with it. And when when you hear that, um, when you hear that uh, extracurricular, and the thing that always strikes me is that whenever cuts are going to be made in education, do you know what the things they covered for us? Extracurricular activities, art, music, theater, sports. Those are things that are cut out for us. 
And th those are areas which are extremely informative, extremely informative. And I know when I was teaching at Burbage High School, I liked soccer. I used to go kick around on football or whatever. I never owned a pair of boots, never joined a club or something. And I asked the boys, I said to the boys, I would like to, to, um, to do some work with them in soccer. And I told them, I said, I never owned a pair of boots, ball. I never um, belonged a member in a club or anything. I said, because what I want to do is to transfer the information I have from working in painting or sculpture to transform that into what they're doing on the field. I said, because what you're doing on the field is about movement. And painting and sculpture is also about movement. So I'm gonna use what I know about that into, the, into, the, into, the, um, into what we're gonna do with soccer. So they listened to me and they agreed. I said, well, if you disagree with what I'm going to be uh, working with you, just tell me, you know, go to hell and I'm off because I don't, I don't want to persuade you. I, I don't like persuading people. I, I, I like the dialogue. I like the dialogue. And so we went ahead and we had great fun because what I did was I, I used to look at the boys kicking a ball around on the field, observing who can do what. And so when I went to the headmaster, he wanted to know, why are you waiting now? I said, because I've been observing what the boys can do. So when I went to them, I said, you play in this, in this kind of fashion. I want you to play in this location. I had a young man, I used to call him a Russian uh, T-32 tank. Because when he gets the ball, he will run straight at you and over you. <laughs> so I told him, I said, I want you to play in your position at the back. You know, I had another one, he wanted to score a goal, but every time he kicked the ball, it goes over the goal post, goes on the road and a bus runs over the ball. So I said, I do not want you to be in the forward line. I want you to be a midfield player and continue to play, but from the midfield, because when you kick the ball, instead of going on the road, it's going to land in the goal mouth. And this is exactly what happened. And so um, at least three of those boys eventually had, um, scholarships to study uh, in the United States. They had athletic scholarships, became soccer players, you know. So for me, it was a great it's a thing of, of the, that transference of energy is very, very important. It's very, very important. I'm not, I'm not very familiar with the, with the, with the Chinese uh, um, disciplines of Tai Chi and things like that, um, but I, uh, the Jai Jitsu and all about that, it's the same principle I feel is being applied there, energy the use of energy in a constructive manner. Harnessing on the use of energy, yes. I don't know if that answers your question, sir. <laughs> okay, we're gonna take one final question, I think, from Vanda, Vanda Radzik. There you go. Uh, hello, Isabel, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, thank you. So thank you once again, Isabel, and wonderful Mori House. And well, Stanley, Stanley Greaves. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the only word that comes to mind <laughs> is, you know, constellation. Someone just use that word, constellation, because today, this afternoon, it's as if we are in the middle of this wonderful constellation, you know, that is Stanley Greaves. I don't know uh, anyone else in the world, at least in the world in which I live and in Guyana that is so multifaceted. Well, they, got, Stanley, they, got, they, got, they got a lot of people like that. Stanley, <laughs> Stanley is a musician, a guitarist. <laughs> he is a writer and a poet. Mm. He is a painter. He's yeah. a sculptor. He's a potter. He works in metal. He works mm. in all kinds of other materials. Mm. And he is also a philosopher. Including so it's extraordinary. <laughs> yes, I left out several and uh, etc. And today, what we <laughs> what we've seen in Stanley just sitting back there in his kind of humble but very engaging way is this constellation of power, thought, reality, linkages, curiosity, and all the rest of it. Not to mention, we now know he reading quantum physics as hmm. well into the bargain. And of course, one of his paintings, that wonderful painting, I think it's one of the Wilson paintings with the, all of the, the, the symbols uh, coming out of um, a, a kind of a, a, a creature with a kind of a beak. It's a beautiful, beautiful, um, beautiful painting. 
I am so happy that um, we took a year, my sister and I, and we and we paid. Sunny was very kind in installments, and we are now the proud owners of a painting of the Wilson series called the Dark Jester, mm -hmm. which also sort of resembles a kite. It's absolutely gorgeous. But Stanley, it's just to really, um, to really thank you for this, just for the wonder of just um, sharing, you sharing parts of your wonderful mind and your life and your work with us uh, this afternoon. I wanted to ask you if you might, should there be time, and I hope there is, to also give us some insights, as you did with your conversations with Wilson, on two other um, artists of Guyana. One, of course, Martin Cutter to whom I believe, and I hope these might be documented, you had a series, um, a lifelong series of conversations with Martin nearly every week in his own home um, in Georgetown. And with Bobby Finance, who again is just um, a, a wonderful artist and a wonderful writer. And I know you had a very close, I think from boyhood or a young manhood relationship um, with Bobby. So I just wonder if you might just give us some insights into, um, into, the, into your links with these two wonderful artists of Guyana. Thank you. Um, Bobby, I, I, I first met Bobby when I was teaching at Mitchell School in Fort Standard, and um, we never lost contact with one another. Uh, it, it reached a stage where Bobby um, used to treat me as a member of his family. And um, I remember when he was ill that uh, um, I was allowed to go and see him when some other people were not allowed to do that. And um, for me, it was a very humble, humble, um, humble experience. But Bobby had a very, <laughs> very, very um, he was a very perceptive person. And in that he resembled his father. And um, so that, that power of perception allowed him to, I use the word deliberately, interpret people. <laughs> you know, Bobby could read people and I've seen it do it several times. But I found what I was speaking about earlier on that that power allowed him when he began to take photographs in the interior, it allowed him to present, to, to, um, to photograph the most incredible series of images uh, from the interior of Guyana. And the thing that, that um, I think substantiates the point that I'm making is that Bobby goes into the forest with um, the old camera uh, with 36, 36 uh, frames. And he comes out of the bush with 36 images. And each one did not need editing. And as he says, he sees it and he makes a click and that is it. So it is, it is what I'll be saying, that question of awareness and using your own personal uh, uh, um, abilities that allows you to do certain things. And it allowed, him, it allowed him to do exactly that. And he also wrote poems and he also wrote a wonderful book of short stories. I felt, and I still do feel that Bobby's book of short stories should be um, a, a really essential reading for schools because in it, you get a cross section of Guyana, both its landscape and also of the people, the people who lived in Guyana. It's a most incredible book. Um, I'm not a betting person, but I would have lost thousands of dollars because I felt that Bobby's book should have won the first prize. It didn't. Uh, when I read the first prize uh, book that won the first prize, a good friend of mine who also liked to play guitar, it in no way could be compared to Bobby's book. That book is a masterpiece and it should be made available to children in school. So when I become Minister of Education, that will be one of the first things I will do <laughs> is make sure that book, that book is in the schools because it's, he has a wonderful cross section of people of Guyana. He understood them and the characters, his understanding was placed in the characters that he used um, uh, in, in, those, um, in those short stories. Martin, um, I first met when he came to an exhibition, the Working People's Art Class. As a matter of fact, both himself and Wilson Harris came together. And um, 
got into a conversation with them, and I was sort of, where did these people come from? You know, and Wilson left uh, to go to Britain. Martin was still there. And so I began, I began going to Martin and sitting and speaking with him over many, many, many years. And I, I used to make notes of the things that we, that we discussed. And I learned, the one important thing I learned from Martin was that um, you are responsible for every mark you make, every word you write. You are responsible. And therefore, there's, there's a certain uh, um, ethical behavior that accompanies what it is you do. And those words have stuck with me, um, that particular statement. You know, you are responsible for every mark you make, every scratch, pencil, whatever, everything that you are responsible. And therefore, you have to, you have to uh, um, execute that responsibility in a certain ethical manner. You know, that's one of the things I learned from him. But the thing was that um, with Martin, most of the times um, he would talk sometimes, not all the time, about his poetry, and I would talk about my art. And so we would, we would try to find our correspondences, some sort of dialogue between what he was doing in his poems and what I was doing in my, in my paintings and, 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 and artwork. But, but a lot of the time was actually spent in, uh, in talking about, about uh, uh, philosophy and, and, and uh, metaphysics and things like that. And so for me, it was very, it was very important um, to be with Martin, to be engaged in conversation with him. It was a learning, uh, um, a learning, a very, a very, very important learning process uh, for me. And the lessons I learned still, still, um, still remain. And um, I know that, I know that, um, and the thing I respect about Martin too was that, um, which to some extent is also me. He was interested in this business of um, recognition. I, you want to be recognized. Recognized for what? And what it is that you that you are doing really needs recognition. Why do you feel that this poem you write or this thing that you do, what it needs recognition? And I, I, I um, that has been my my philosophy. And um, I have found then that this is why I said that the po poems for me, the, or the poems that I write for me, represents an internal, an internal dialogue I'm having with myself, which then comes out in the form of a poem or something, it might be a painting, what it is, but it's, it's an internal dialogue. And so for me, um, the process of producing something, what if it is, the process of producing something is also a learning experience. You know, the way I know, um, I remember, uh, people used to laugh at the way in which sometimes friends came in Guyana and they saw me stirring my soup or porridge and they were laughing because I'd be doing that and then I'd be doing that. And they said, why are you doing that? I said, because I have both hands and the movements are complementary. This one goes this way and this one goes that way. <laughs> you know, and um, that also led me to this question, something I discussed with Martin to this question of duality, which has remained on all ongoing an ongoing investigation for me um, I, I've come to the conclusion that the universe the universe is a universe of duality and we cannot we cannot escape that perhaps until we die and move into another dimension we have to deal with it I remember at one time that I used to go around thinking why is it when you think of a word the opposite is there you, you don't even have to think of the opposite the opposite exists and you can use it so I used to go around thinking okay um, up and down, up and down. Is there some word which can encapsulate both? And the only word I can think of is location. It, it's those two terms identify some form of location or movement. And, um, and that took me into further uh, thinking about duality. And then of course, duality leads into a trinity, the trinity and the, 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 the symbol of the triangle, uh, very important, and the circle. And um, I even have a little notebook uh, based on Euclid's theory number five of the parallel lines, where uh, parallel lines are connected by a line that cuts across. So that line that cuts across connects both sides. So I thought, well, then there must be something within us that allows us to cut, or, cut across 
the different levels of experience. And the more levels of experience you can cut across is the more you will find the angles that relate to one another. And so that led me to using Euclid to explain uh, certain conundrums or things I had running around in my mind. Yes, so that's, that's how it goes. Um, yes, I learned, I learned this business of, of, um, of integrity and um, your moral responsibilities to what, to what you do um, uh, from Martin. I also learned from him this business of the use of words that you have to be, you have to be very careful of how you use words. And so this is why my, um, my notebooks, the original poem is all lines doing all kinds of things because I'm trying to make sure that I get the word and I don't want extraneous matter. And so those long descriptive poems, they lose me. I get lost in them. You know, I got to get to the, to the essence of the thing right away. Um, so that is, I think I'm wondering. Yes, I am wondering. Um, Martin, I learned those things from him, yes. That, that sense of responsibility and that, um, that recognition is not, is not the goal that, you, that, is, that is all that important to you. I've seen its importance to other people and what they have been able to do because they were seeking recognition. And I, I don't hold that against them, but that, that is not, that's not the path. That's not the path I want to go. And that's not the path that I personally have been following either. So I live a monastic existence. I think that's probably as good a note to end on as, as any, <laughs> your monastic existence. Yes. Um, I feel this is one of the evenings when we could, we could continue um, uh, into the, the wee hours, but we won't. Um, so warm thanks, Stanley, for this. Um, I think we've all, we've, uh, we've covered a lot of terrain. Um, and uh, it's been very illuminating. Um, and I noticed from the, the chat that uh, uh, lots of other people have, have found it uh, very interesting and stimulating as well. Mm -hmm. So thank you for um, sharing your thoughts with us and some of your poetry. Um, oh. and I, have, I have to thank you. I started to cut in like this before you end off. I have to thank you for um, inviting me to, to, to take part in this exercise and for providing the opportunity to do this. And I must say um, how much you and your team have been able to put together the images, the different images together, um, you know, to make sense, to, to make sense of the presentation. Yes. Um, the, 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 the guitar playing, um, was a little off. I think it's, it's, it's the, 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 the um, the recording, huh? And this is why I had wanted to record him here at a friend of mine, but he was ill. And so I couldn't go to the studio to do that. So mm -hmm. some of the notes and things sort of fade away. Yeah, that's about what we, time. we have something to aim for, for the next yes. time. So <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, thank you very much to everyone for joining us. Sure. Um, and, uh, to, just to let you know, there's quite a lot um, happening uh, with the Trust this month. So um, our next poetry recital will um, be to commemorate World Poetry Day on the 21st of March. And then on the 24th of March, um, very topical, um, given the content of this evening's discussion, we will pay tribute to Wilson Harris. Um, with readings from some of his novels and a recital of some of his poems. So, I mean, I've um, Stan, uh, Mr. Mitchell, and any others who might want to um, contribute to that in some shape or form, please do get in touch. Um, we'd, we'd love to, we'd love to have you um, involved um, and to uh, anyone else. Um, so thank you again, and we look forward to seeing you all um, the next time. Um, have a good evening, and uh, yes, um, see you in a in a in a week or two. Thank you, Isabel. Okay, thank you.
Thank you all for asking questions. I love, I love answering questions because as Martin says, you're going to talk, you're going to talk. And he's right. Because in speaking, you, 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 um, you find things that were in your mind and you're able to you know, bring them to a point. Yes, you discover mm -hmm. things. Yeah. Mm -hmm.